thrown out the first pitch at Fenway Park. Does, does that, I mean, you've done everything there is to do, it seems, but you haven't done this. So do you actually this. get a little nervous about I this? I was really nervous. And then everybody's got advice. Like, are you practicing? Make sure it doesn't bounce. Uh, I just got to make sure I warm up. But yeah, it's a tremendous honor. And you know, as a kid growing up here, you know, this was it. And, you know, you always had the, cor the curse of the babe, right? We'd get to the playoffs. And I remember, I'm, I'm wearing 27 tonight, awesome. who was my hero, Carlton Fisk. You know, and I remember um, 76 when he hit the home run. I was like, is it going to go? Is it going to go? And, and the next day at school, we would play that moment over and over again. And now to be here to throw out the first pitch is... Uh, it's very special. And I remember sitting right over here where it's 14 and 15 in that area. First time I came to, to watch a game in person. Down from Maine. Yeah, I came down from Maine. It was a big trip for us. See, now, I'm, yeah, I'm from Lewiston. You're from the suburbs of Lewiston. Right. Uh, but but it's when you come down here, I, I try to tell people from Boston who came here a lot as a kid, like I came once a year if I was lucky. Yeah. And it was, oh my God, Fenway Park. Well, the big trip into right? Boston was right. a big deal. Right. And then Fenway Park and the history and was 112 years this yeah, year. Yeah, very good. Coming up. Yeah. So, but when you walk out here as a kid and the green is around you, it's well, just... Well, you hear so much about the green monster, right? And then you see it in person and then you see the crowd and the energy and uh, it was overwhelming and I just remember smiling the whole time. So, uh, and I still feel that way coming in today. Do, so do you have something in mind? I mean, it, like, so Will Ferrell came in throughout the first pitch years ago uh -huh. and we had him on the show before the game. And he went out and imitated Louis Tian, like the arms and legs and herky jerky. Oh, and the turnaround. Yeah, the whole turnaround. Yeah, I thought around, about everything. doing that. <laughs> That's a, yeah. He kind of pulled it off a little bit. And then of course you had Rob Gronkowski, right? Just spiked it. Just spiked it. That was like a couple weeks yeah, ago. Just, yeah, yeah. Last uh, Patriots Day. Yeah. Uh, Giselle Bundchen came in, and Dennis Eckersley was with me, and he said, "Well, you got to aim up yes. because you're stepping down." Right. And she launched it, it like a 50 feet overhead oh, and really? then blasted him on the Today Show the next day. So don't, I'm giving you no well, advice. I'm, just I'm sure that doesn't happen. I can get it across the plate and it doesn't bounce. We always say we only show them when they're horribly bad. So well, maybe that's what I, I hope do. we don't show it. Okay, I hope we don't show it tonight. Uh, you actually, you told me this before, that, that you remember watching that Carlton Fisk home run in the 75 World Series. It's oh, yeah, I see it as clear as uh, it was like yesterday. It was such a big moment. And that was a great game, went down to that, that, that pitch. Yeah. And then um, I just remember him going down, first baseline, and just said, go, go, go. And then it went over, and it was like an amazing moment. And then the next day at school, everybody was reliving that moment. Because everyone's parents let them stay up late. Yeah. It was really late. It was I really remember late. going to school groggy-eyed the next day. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah so cool. Well, we, we were so up. energized yeah. by that. And, then, uh, and you wear his number 27, which yeah. is really, really cool. Well, I was a catcher, and uh, you know, that's what I was the catcher, so that he was my idol. And, and speaking of idols, we were at the golf tournament last year, uh, the Driver Kids right. uh, up in Falmouth, and, and suddenly you're, you've got a bat in your hand and Roger Clemens is throwing to you. Well, I had played around with uh, Roger Clemens, which was great. I couldn't believe it, you know, and he's so approachable, such a nice guy. And I think we were on uh, maybe the 14th or 15th hole, and then this kid came out and he said, hey, Roger, would you, would you mind, you know, can you play catch? Um, and then he had a bat too, and I'm like, well, can I hit against you? And he goes, yeah, sure. And we had a, a little game right, on, right in the middle of the, the golf course. Is that, like, do you feel like a, a fan again? Are you, are you Patrick Dempsey from Maine at that point, the Red Sox fan? Absolutely, turned back into a little kid. I mean, the whole round, I mean, he was playing worse than I was, which was good, <laughs> uh, I was happy about that. And uh, we had a good time, we got a chance to get to know him, to talk to him, and the impact he made in this community is huge, so. It was really special, and, and how genuine he was and how kind he was with the fans was nice to see. Every year, we do the uh, Jimmy Fun Telethon, and every year he donates batting practice. He flies in, and you bring 10 people out, kids, whatever, and he, right. does, bat he does pitching lessons yeah. for them, and then right. he always doubles it. You know, and just always willing to stop and give back, and, right. and you've always done that. Like, you've never forgotten about me. That's always been your foundation, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's where you come from. Uh, you, you learn your values there. I think Maine in general is really about community, about giving back, a lot of philanthropic work that's done there, that's quietly done. Um, and I got some good advice early on, never forget where you come from. And uh, you know, I go back and you remember where you started, where you are today, where you want to go, and then what can you do to improve your community. And, and that's all the values that started here. And, and I feel like you've kept that, I think better than most people, who have achieved success, you've made it part of who you are. Like the Peloton Project. You, you do I, movies that sort of reflect those values. You've right. always tried to bring that with you in your career, haven't you? 
Yes, I think it's, it forms you, you know, and I think growing up, uh, certainly in the Lewiston Auburn area, at that time a lot of those mills were closing. Mm -hmm. It's a very tough community, not a lot of hope, not a, a lot of inspiration. And so when anyone would come into the community, it was a big deal. And I never forgot that. And I look around and, you know, just, I was very fortunate where things uh, happened for me, but I could still very easily be there, uh, you know, working. And a lot of the mills are gone, a lot of the industry's gone. And there's a lot of need there, and certainly what happened a, a year ago, we're mm. six months out from the shooting, yeah. um, and uh, we have to remember, uh, you know, we have to remember our community and support our community. And you did that. You came out and, and posted some things and said some things. It meant a lot. Yeah, we played softball. You know, there's nothing yeah. like getting people together to play baseball. Billy was there. Yeah, yeah, he was there. So we had a great time. It was very competitive. A lot of good clubs that, that came up to support the event. And um, I had a lot of fond memories playing baseball in Lewis and Auburn, Buckfield, Lewis and Auburn, in that area, yeah. and then Turner as well. And um, you know, it's just, a, it's just, there's nothing like getting a ball and, and playing together. And that really was, I think, part of the healing process for everyone. I remember I spoke at the vigil two days after, and <clears throat> I used the line. Yeah, my son once said, you know, it was talking about. He's like, man, you've got a work ethic like nobody I know, and. I remember just my immediate reaction was, well, I'm from Lewiston. Right. Like, that's, you have to. You like, had to, you work. Have to work. If you wanted anything, you had to have a job, you had to, uh, you're, you know, I got down here maybe a couple times just because the family couldn't afford to do it. We always had food on the table, but you understood the value of the dollar and you had to go to work. I remember picking up drops uh, and, and doing all that and a few days of muck and stalls and I was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore. But yeah, you, you have to have a good work ethic. And that's carried you, obviously, and you've brought it back. The work you've done back home, the Dempsey Center, uh, obviously you went through watching your mother battle cancer, and, and that kind of made you realize there was an opportunity to help other people going through the things. Take us through that process. Right, bit. so my mother was diagnosed, uh, I think it was in 90, 97, 98, and she had uh, over 12 reoccurrences. Mm -hmm. She was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Uh, fought a really long battle until about 2014, and that was just too much. And um, you know, when you have that diagnosis in the family, it's devastating. You don't want to do, and you want to be able to give back. And thank God my sister worked in the hospital, so she could navigate the conversations with the nurses and the doctors and gave us an understanding. But it wasn't until I started working with the Amgen Tour to California uh, that I was exposed to their Breakaway from Cancer initiative, and that's where the wellness center was uh, first presented to me, or wraparound care. So what we do at the center, which was inspired by my mom's cancer journey, and there was nothing like this in Wilson and Auburn at the time, is what we do is we don't treat the disease, we treat the person holistically in wraparound care, meaning counseling, um, health and wellness, comfort, uh, nutrition, yoga, uh, acupuncture, and Reiki. And uh, we do that, and the services are at no cost to anyone who needs our support, as well as the caregivers and kids. That's amazing. And it was inspired by my mom's journey. Right. And because, again, there was nothing like that. Then. No, and, there, and, and our, our big mission is to really spread the word because it should be, as soon as you're diagnosed, it should be standardized care. Because you can wait two or three weeks before you get your test results back, before you know exactly what you're going to do. And that's a time when we need to come in and help people sort of go, okay, what can we do to help support you and your family? We were talking before about the home-based program they do here, and it's the same idea, right? Like, there, there's medicines and there's treatments, and right. they say here's your oncologist, and here's where you'll go for radiology. Right. But nobody holds your hand. No, and there's also, no humanity. There's no humanity, and what happens is once you're done your treatment, you're left, and you're done. And you've, you've had great success with you know, treating disease, but now we need to treat the person, and that's where we come in. The Dempsey Challenge has, has fueled this for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's been, a huge event in Lewiston, by the way. It's a, a big event, guy, and, and it's really brought the community together, yeah. too, and there's a lot of pride there. Uh, we couldn't do it out without the community, the money that's been raised. I think we've are close to $30 million now over the last 16 years. It will be September 21st this year. We've condensed it into one day where we do the run, the walk, and the ride. And that's really to promote people to stay active, right? If you're active, you feel better emotionally, you feel better mentally, and it gives you that, uh, that strength to, you know, fight the disease. And, and the spirit of it. Tremendous spirit. Right? because people are there because they want to be, they've been impacted, their hearts are wide open, uh, and it's a really special day. 
And, and it's grown, right? I mean, it was in Lewiston. Now it's Portland. I know there's a new well, one. We have two facilities now, right? Yeah. So we have the Lewiston, which was the original right. center. And now we're in South Portland. Uh, we're waiting for our new facility, which will be at Rock Row in uh, February of 25, uh, because we're just bursting at the seams uh, in Portland right now. And um, the services, the word is getting out there, and people come in, and they're so relieved that they have this uh, support system. In full disclosure, I just had my first board meeting yeah, as a member of the board, so yeah. I, I actually know a little bit of what I'm talking about here. And we have a great board, too. Uh, we have amazing some really great group people, people who understand, uh, who have been impacted themselves, either personally or family member, uh, and uh, the compassion is incredible. But I found it, what I didn't know, being a Maine and knowing what I thought I knew about the center and, 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 and the support is that it's now spreading outside New England. Like yes. 32 states, I think. We're servicing 32 states, yeah. yes. Which is... Virtually. So virtually, like, right. But like, that ca kind of came out of COVID, right? Well, I mean, it did. Like, we were yeah. always working on that. And then with COVID, that really accelerated the program. Uh, and now we're treating a lot of people virtually. And certainly in rural Maine, it's very hard to get into Lewiston, especially if you're up north. The word's getting out there, so people are calling in. Um, and uh, it's, it's benefiting a lot of people. It's amazing, isn't it, that we kind of go to technology, we talk about humanity, but you're actually connecting people to have a human conversation through the technology. Right, because we're listening to them. Right. Right, and they can communicate. They can let go of all of the, the fear and the anxiety with a professional who knows how to take care of them. But now we're starting to see uh, more of um, people wanting to come back into the center, that mm. want to be in person, which is really good, uh, and, and working together as a group. And the demand is very high, which means we have to work much harder with our fundraising because all of these services are free. Um, so our, our mission is in our, our goals are, are being reached, which means we have to work even that much harder now to raise the money to make sure that these services are at no cost. Where does it go from here? Uh, just spreading the word nationally, right? I mean, there are a lot of people throughout the country didn't realize this was the type of thing that was possible, that the supportive care is there. We're reaching out to other like-minded centers. We just discovered a wonderful called Cancer Care in New York City. They've been around since 1944. It was inspired by a man who lost both his mother and father within six months, and we're continuing that. And then basically um, making people aware. That's our mission nationally. And then connecting with other like-minded centers throughout the, the country. And we're also servicing uh, four countries as well. Wow. And people can help. Obviously, they can sign up for the challenge. They can sign up for the challenge. It's going to be September 21st uh, this year. And uh, you can go online to DempseyChallenge.org and register. Or if you need any help, go to the DempseyCenter.org and see if we can help you with any of the online services that we have. Okay, I think I've just set a record. It's the longest interview you've gone without anybody asking about being the sexiest man on earth. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Thank you very because much. here you're just a main sports hall of fame, or right. a driver. You know, sexy comes way down on the list uh, of the baseball. It's sort of funny that it's happening at this point in my <laughs> life. So um, nice to have the attention of my age. <laughs> what was the reaction? Like, I always thought somebody was joking. I thought they were making fun of me, <laughs> but uh, it, it worked out nicely. So I enjoy the attention. <laughs> but uh, no lie, I mean, you're a main sports hall of famer. You, I am, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a tremendous honor. Yeah. yeah, I think because of the challenge and certainly with uh, with racing, yeah. you know, sports car racing, and I'm getting ready to go. I'll go to Spain tomorrow for a two-day test in Barcelona, and I'll get back in the car this year. I've got four races in a new endurance series with Porsche. Uh, we've got a couple good sponsors on board, Tag Heuer, uh, and uh, Mobile One will be taking care of us. As thrilling now as it was when you first got behind the wheel? Even more so. I appreciate it that much more now. I took a break in 2015, I'd reached all my goals, and it was a tremendous sacrifice. Like anything you want to do and do it well, you're going to have to sacrifice something. It was a lot of time away from my family, and I was like, I can't justify this anymore. I, I, I wanted to get on the podium at Le Mans, I achieved that. And then I could feel there was a dissipation of energy, you know, where I was like, I, I, this is not, the fire's not there anymore. I want to be home, I want to be with my kids, and I want to be with my wife and family. And I just sort of stepped back from a lot of things, other than, of course, the center. It allowed me more time to spend at the center and to help there. Um, and now I'm getting back into it. My son's like, yeah, Dad, you got to get back in the car. I think he has uh, an agenda as well. <laughs> well just don't tell his mother. I was going yeah. <laughs> well, to ask that because players will say, like, you have young kids, and it, it, mm. the, it all takes you away from them. Yes. But then there comes a point where they're old enough to appreciate what you're doing, and now you share it with them. Yes, I did. I, I had my, 
my son just got his license and I took him to the Experience Center in Carson, which is Porsche does this team driving school, which is really helpful for car control, yeah. situational awareness, understanding what the, the car is capable of. If there, there's, a, there's a great track, because we have so much snow and rain up here, you can lose control of the car really quickly. So it teaches the eye-hand coordination and how to get the car corrected. And he had a great time doing that. Uh, it's, well, my, it's funny. My wife was a claims insurance adjuster for a while, so I felt bad for my two sons, because they were constantly, nope, we're going out, like after yeah. they got their license, but it's really important. Yeah, it is. I mean, you do the written exam and then you drive a little bit, but I think it's important if you have an opportunity or there's anything in this community where there's a driving program, I highly recommend it. So you're going back to drive. What's next for Patrick Dempsey? Really focusing on the center. That's been the big thing, getting my kids now into college. That's the next step. So we're doing a lot of tours. Uh, there's that pressure, and then, uh, and then we'll see how they are in the world. That's awesome. Congratulations on all the success. Thank you. Thanks Good for having me you. here today. Awesome. Thanks. Pleasure. Well done. See you on the golf course. See you on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be well, way I'll see you in the woods the balls. <laughs> oh, it's over there again. Yeah.